Well, good morning. We want to welcome you to Williams Creek Baptist Church. It is a unique, unique day in terms of our gathering because um, the next few weeks or however long we, we see uh, these things developing in, in our country and around the world, uh, we'll be meeting together, but uh, throughout the Middle High Valley in our homes, and we just want to encourage each one of you today as you gather as families and as individuals, as you're thinking about family and friends, and as we think about our nation and, and the, the, the leaders of our nation and the leadership of the nations of the world, uh, we know there's a lot going on, and we know that there's a lot of challenges that people are facing, and we've got people that, um, because of this virus, have taken ill, and some have passed away, and so there's a lot unfolding in our world, and we're thankful for the leadership of our nation and our states and our local municipalities who are working hard. We're thankful for uh, the gift of uh, our medical community and just the the dedication that they have in, in serving uh, their fellow man, man and, and woman as, as they work with these cases in the hospital and as they come alongside and work together. We're just thankful for uh, our businesses and, and the people that, that are making sacrifices right now so that we can come alongside of one another um, and, and care for one another. And we just need to continue to pray for one another. And so as we gather here this morning... Uh, here at Williams Creek Baptist Church. Um, I want us to take some time, um, as we began last week, looking at uh, the, the songs of the Scripture, and in particular, uh, the songs that we find in the book of Psalms, and the encouraging word that God has for us as He introduces us. As often, um, we think of the songs, these poems that are, are written by people like uh, David and Solomon and others, um, they certainly are relevant to their own life experiences. But as we see the Psalms unfolding, uh, we see over and over again how they point us to the one true God who is sovereign, who is working in this world to redeem a people for his own possession. And so this morning we're going to look at a Psalm, Psalm 46. What comes to your mind when I ask the question, what is your favorite song? Songs have a tremendous and lasting impact and significant influence upon our lives. Songs are connected to historic eras in our lives. Hearing a particular song may take you back to a specific time or place or an event or a person in your life. The Bible is filled with a variety of songs that bear witness to God's identity, His character, and His intervention in human history. The Psalms comprise a catalog of such songs. For instance, Psalm 46. This was Martin Luther's favorite psalm. Luther was the chief catalyst of the Protestant Reformation. And in his day, he defied the Holy Roman Emperor, Charles V, by refusing to recant his writings concerning the biblical doctrines of the Christian faith. He had been called to Worms, Germany, to appear before the Diet, that is, the assembly of the Holy Roman Empire, and answer charges of heresy. He refused to recant and rescind his doctrinal positions that were founded in the Word of God. Luther, in the midst of these circumstances, he wrote a hymn. He wrote this hymn on his way to the Diet of Worms. The beginning, a strong fortress is our God is very much taken from this psalm, Psalm 46. In the darkest times, he used to say, Come, let us sing the 46th psalm, and let them do their worst. He powerfully and miraculously preserves 
and defends his church and his word against all fanatical spirits, against the gates of hell, against the implacable hatred of the devil, against all the assaults of the world, the flesh, and sin. Who does this? God. The one true God. Our God. We find ourselves in what could readily be described as an assault in our time on this fallen world. The outbreak of, of a virus moving throughout the entire world is, is shaking the very foundations of life and proving a formidable force through far-reaching illnesses and even economic fallout. As those who belong to Christ's church, we are praying for our nation's leadership and leadership around the world as they enjoin those with, within the medical community and those with both the private and public industries and organizations to meet these ever-growing challenges. And as we pray for godly intervention and wisdom and mercy for our families, our community, our nations, as the effect is worldwide, we gather together to take counsel from the Lord in His Holy Word. Because as one fellow pastor shared just a few days ago, those without the Lord and the promises of the gospel have hope only in this world and its visible means of support. As those means crumble, where does anybody turn? This morning we turn to Psalm 46. A song of hope declaring that God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. I encourage you to open your Bibles with me this morning to Psalm 46. And let us begin there in verse 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear Though the earth should change, and though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake at its swelling pride, Selah. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy dwelling places of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She will not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations made an uproar. The kingdom, the kingdoms tottered. He raised his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Selah. Come. Behold the works of the Lord who has wrought desolation in the earth. He makes Wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariots with fire. Cease striving and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Selah. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we just thank you for the gift of these powerful words. These powerful words that reveal your character. That reveal your wisdom as we walk through such days as we find ourselves in. God, we pray for not only our nation, but the nations around the world. We pray for the leaders of these nations that are working towards addressing and mitigating the factors that are the result of this virus that has been spreading. And the lives that have been Im impacted, Lord, we know by your mercy that you can preserve these lives. We pray for the families who have lost loved ones as a result of this virus. And Lord, we pray for those who are working on the front lines in the medical community, and we just pray that you will continue to strengthen them in their daily work. 
and minister to the souls of these individuals, minister to our souls. May as we walk through these days and as, as we talk about uncertainty and the, the way of our life is changing at, at this point in our history, things that we thought we had control over, Father God, we find outside of our control. Lord, we know that all things are under your mighty hand. And Father God, you are working in this world. And not only can you preserve life in this world, but the most gracious gift is that you preserve life for eternity. And so maybe through these days where we have questions, where people are looking for answers, maybe we gather here together and find rest in our true God and Redeemer. May we find rest even in the midst of these trials. That as David would declare in Psalm 23, that though we walk through the valley of the shadow of evil or, or of death, we fear not evil, for your rod and your staff, they comfort us. So Lord, comfort us. Comfort your church, the people of your possession that you have redeemed with the blood of your Son, and Lord, may these words bring hearts to believe and to trust and to rest in you, O God. It's in the name of Jesus Christ I pray. And amen. This morning, let us find great confidence in the truths that this psalm of David reveals about the rest that is to be found in the one and only true Redeemer God. May we come to believe four different characteristics that we find here that it, David reveals about God and who He is. First, let us rest in the strength of God. Second, let us rest in the security of God. Third, let us rest in the sovereignty of God. And finally, let us rest in the knowledge of God. Let us begin there in verse 1. Let us rest in the strength of God. David declares, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. As he begins this song, he begins so by revealing the amazing attributes and character of the one true creator God, the creator of this universe. David is declaring essential truths about God and knowing these divine attributes become a means of building our faith. Building our faith to believe in the ultimate reality over our present circumstances you and I are often guilty of reading our present circumstances, especially um, when they are overwhelming and traumatic. They have our attention. It's hard to think about anything else, but I want to encourage you to lift up your eyes, to listen to the truths that are revealed here in God's Word. Because these overwhelming and traumatic circumstances that we find in our day are not, are not the final word on reality. David reveals that behind all of these ominous circumstances, there is a greater reality, a larger reality. And that reality transcends even our own personal specific circumstances that we find ourselves in. Specifically here, he declares these great realities beginning here with God is our refuge and strength. Our very present help in trouble. Let's take each one of those statements one at a time. God is our refuge. The Hebrew word here for refuge is a unique word with regards to shelter. It a refuge is a shelter, is a place of covering. It's a place uh, to run to and 
to take cover. The actual pronunciation of this word, makasa. And it means shelter. I am reminded from my high school days when I was taking Spanish 1 and Spanish 2, one of the sentences I remember having to memorize and keep to my mind, and I still have it to this day, was about house or shelter in Spanish, casa. And I remember learning this specific sentence in terms of conversation, uh, you know, welcoming somebody to my house in Spanish. Mi casa es su casa, which means my house is your house. But this word, makasa, in the Hebrew, when we think of this word, it's much deeper than, hey, let's go to God's house and find shelter. No, it's much deeper than this. God is not just merely the provider of a shelter. God is the shelter, is what he's saying. David is declaring, God is our refuge. He is our shelter. He is our refuge. And so this speaks powerfully to the security that we gain because God is our defense. And that speaks to his strength. The second statement, that not only is God is our refuge, but God is our strength. Now, what does David mean? What is he describing here? He could certainly mean that God is the source of our inner strength and courage. And that certainly would be true, and the Bible reveals certainly those truths again and again. But yet, David is describing something much more specific concerning the attribute of God here. Not simply that God is just simply providing strength for us, but that he that God is God is the strength for us. God is the one who is strong when you and I are weak. And we find ourselves in those types of circumstances on any given day, even in this moment in history. There's a lot of people experiencing weakness, uncertainty, fear. The Apostle Paul, he was given an incredible vision from God concerning heaven. And yet, because of that vision, he was not permitted to share it. We don't, we don't know what he saw. But with all the, the challenges and the difficulties, the sufferings, the trial, the tribulation, it's, it's thought that that God, in, in His awesome and powerful ways, provided that revelation. We, we will one day know what Paul saw. But we do not know it from Scripture. Matter of fact, Paul gives this account with regards to those circumstances and that vision in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. And it speaks the reality of God's strength, God being our strength, in our weakness, he writes in verse 7, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that he might leave me. And he, that is the Lord, he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for, my, for power is perfected in weakness. So Paul goes on to say that most gladly, therefore, I will th- rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content 
with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties. For Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. And that's what God is revealing through David. God is strong. And in our fellowship with Him, in this life in which we are living, as fellow believers, we have experienced the strength of the Lord in our lives. We have seen His hand through seasons of difficulty. And this season that we're experiencing right now is just one of many that we have seen throughout world history. And yet God is revealing something to us here, that He is our refuge. You believe in God? Know that He is our refuge, and He is our strength. And yet David goes on to share one more reality with regards to this attribute of God. David states that God is our very present help in trouble. Now, sometimes we see that not only in the Hebrew language, but also in the, in the Greek language in terms of the Scripture, where there is an emphasis added to a particular word. And so, for instance, the word here is present, that God is present. God is saying to us that He is present here with us. He's not distant He's not off doing something else. No, He is right here in the midst of these circumstances. And David emphasizes this statement. He says that our God is very present. In other words, God is not just simply present or near, but that He is exceedingly, very present near in other words david is describing god as he is ultimately and always right here working in our lives he is not somewhere else but he is right here in these circumstances in your life as a believer david himself experienced this exceedingly near presence of the lord and he recorded it in psalm 23 and we talked about this psalm last week we noted that in psalm 22 uh, david is crying out to god and he's like crying out my god my god why have you forsaken me and he's just pouring out his heart where are you god and yet by the time we get to psalm 23 we note that that david changes his view from his circumstances to the Lord because we see there in, in the beginning of verse 1 of Psalm 23, he declares, he declares from the word, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And then he goes in on to describe how God is at work in his life, how he is there. And, and he goes on to say in verse 4, that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and that there could be no dar darker valley, none. For some people, that is uh, the greatest fear in all of life, is walking through death, facing death. And so David is declaring, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and he was walking through that valley, he had people that was pursuing him who wanted to end his life. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. Why? Because he says of the Lord, for you are with me. So therefore, on the basis that God is our refuge, and God is our strength, and God is our very present help in trouble, we will not fear. David took great comfort in his circumstances, even circumstances that he believed might end his life. And yet he said, I will not fear. 
I will fear no evil. Even walking through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. And that's what David says in Psalm 46, verse 2. We, not, we need not fear because God is our refuge and strength and very present help in this trouble. In trouble, in general, he says. And he gives a description of this trouble. He paints a portrait it for our minds so that we can see um, you know, what could be one of the most uh, unthinkable things that people would face in this world. And David is describing here in verses 2 through 3 what we see as the unmaking, the uncreation of the world. Listen to what he says there in uh, verse 2 after he says, Therefore we will not fe fear, though the earth should change. Well, in what way is he describing that the earth is changing? He says, Though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea. And when we think about Genesis 1, the account of creation, when God, the sovereign God, creator of this world and this universe, creator of all humanity, we find there in the very beginning that the earth is filled with water. It is all water. And from that water, God raises up, God divides what becomes the land from the water that covered the entirety of the earth. But here, in Psalm 46, David is describing a scenario, an unthinkable scenario, where the land, that is, the mountains, are thrown back into the sea. He further describes this catastrophic scene when he says, Though its waters roar and foam, we, we just see the rage. When, when the, the mountains are um, sinking and falling into the sea, we see the waters just enraged and roaring and foaming up. And then he describes uh, this experience as the mountains quake, as an earthquake. And there are many people in our world, around the world, who have experienced the reality of shaking earth, moving earth violently because of earthquakes. And so David is encouraging the rest of us to rest in the strength of God. That even in the midst of the world, in its, let's say, in its total and utter destruction, we don't have to fear. If this world is passing away, we do not have to fear. For our God is with us. Secondly, not only should we and can we rest in the strength of God, but we can rest in the security of God. In verse 4, he gives us this first image, and it reveals a serene and secure city. There is a river, David writes, whose streams make glad the city of God. And that river now is in contrast to the raging and roaring waters that he just wrote about in terms of the cataclysmic destruction or the fall of the world now he he paints this picture in our mind of this beautiful city and there's this calm flowing life-giving stream that is flowing into the city and listen to how he describes this city it says it the, the these streams these living waters these streams make glad this city and it is of all cities it is the city of God. The city belongs to God. And the inhabitants of this city are glad. They are rejoicing. 
The inhabitants of this city are singing glad songs of praise to Him, to God, because they are completely secure. And then he goes on to describe this city as the holy dwelling places of the Most High. In other words, just as David has already told us, he is there. He is very present. This is the dwelling places. The dwelling places of the Most High God. And Israel had experienced that. They had experienced it here on earth. When God determined to make his dwelling among his people Israel, he instructed them to build a tabernacle, a big tent. There were great instructions in terms of its design and its construct and then how they were to approach it and who could go into the different layers into the tabernacle. And then once it was created and it was established, erected, and the, the, the people of Israel had gathered around and, and, and under the instruction of God in that moment, God revealed himself. His glory came down from heaven and filled the tabernacle. God came and dwelled among his people, his people Israel. And I want you to know that, that what, what we see here described before us even has future reality. These are future truths that they're speaking about. That one of these days, that when this earth does pass away, we find in the scriptures, even the scriptures all the way to the very end of the book of the uh, book of the Bible known as Revelations, that there is a city, there is a new heaven and a new earth and a, a new Jerusalem. And God declares that he has now made his dwelling among men. And those men and those women, that humanity that he has made his dwelling among are those that he has redeemed through his son. So the first image reveals a serene and secure city. This is the city of God. And the people that are in the city, behind these secure walls of, of the most holy dwelling place of God, they are glad, they are thrilled, they are praising and singing songs of praise to God. But the second image here in verse 6 reveals that the city of God is surrounded by an innumerable horde of enemy nations. And we see it described simply there in the first part of verse 6 that the nations made an uproar. And these are God's enemies. And these are the enemies of the people of God that he is describing here. And David, he knew that firsthand. He was the king of Israel. And he faced many enemies, not only of the, the people of God, but of, of God himself, because the enemies of God are the enemies of his people. And so the kingdoms, they were moved with in, the indignation. They, they made an uproar. They were making them, their, their presence noted, surrounding the city of God, where these people were glad in song. And he goes on to describe what happens to these raging, roaring nations that had surrounded the city of God. It says here that the kingdoms tottered. Well, that's just another way of saying that they fell. They were overthrown. They were defeated. And how? How did these nations fall? How does David describe the fall of these nations? It's simply with the voice of God. It says here that he raised his voice and the earth melted. A pastor and theologian, J. Legan Duncan, he writes, here's how Martin Luther catches this truth. It's right at the end of a stanza of the stanza three in his hymn, A Mighty Fortress. 
is our God. He's spoken about a world that's filled with devils threatening to tear us apart, to undo us. And then he says, but we will not fear because God has willed his truth to triumph through us. Now his focus is not simply on devils and demons, but specifically here on Satan himself, the evil one, the accuser of God's people, the prince of darkness grim, he calls him. We tremble not for him. His rage we can endure because his doom is sure. One little word. God speaks one little word. And that fells him. In other words, that totters. That defeats him. Now that launches him into the final stanza. The word above all earthly, that word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them abides. God spoke his word. We see it over and over described in the battles of Israel, how God, God, he says, I will, the battle belongs to the Lord. I will fight the battle. You trust in my word. You walk in my word and my ways. Be encouraged. God's voice, even right now, as, as you're hearing this message, I am a spokesman. I am I'm a preacher of the very word of God. And this is God's voice that he is speaking to us here today. Be encouraged by the word of the Lord today. Take great strength and hope and the security that we have in the Lord. Our lives are in His very hands. So even with this city surrounded by the formidable enemies of this world, and we know that these kingdoms tottered, they fell, and they fell because God spoke it. He declared it. He decreed that that is what would happen when they melted, the earth melted. These nations melted as if they didn't exist. David describes further the hope that we have in this God who can simply speak. And amazing, miraculous things happen. They can be encouraged. Again, he speaks to the presence of God, the very present help of God in trouble in verse 5 God is in the midst of her he's right there he is in the midst of the city he has not set up the city and started taking rent and selling properties and then going on somewhere he is right there this is his city this is where he dwells among his people he is with them in their midst and guess what though you have the enemy surrounding you he says she will not be moved. The city of God will not be moved. And the city of God is more than just a location. It is his people that he dwells among. And then he goes on to encourage them. God will help her when morning dawns. You know, that's a a very familiar statement. When you hear that, that, that morning dawns statement. We, we not only find that here from David as he's describing, you know, and sometimes we think, you know, into, in getting into the night and the darkness and we have struggles in the night and yet we think of the morning dawning as a new day, new opportunity, new hope. And that's exactly what Jeremiah speaks about in Lamentate. Lamentations chapter 3 when he describes his horrendous circumstances as a prophet the challenges I mean they they were overwhelming him and they were uh, so overwhelming him and so ominous in his life that you know he he felt like he was really that he was going to die and yet in Psalm or in Lamentations chapter 3 Beginning of verses 19 and 20, he, he begins to, to turn 
his mind and his thoughts away from his circumstances which were overwhelming him and pressing upon him and he begins to cast his gaze to the truths of God's word. And one of the statements that he makes uh, there in, in terms of, of those circumstances is that God's mercies are new every morning. They don't run out. The mercies of God are endless. And the mercies of God are among us. God in His mercy is at work in our lives, even in these days, in these circumstances. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we don't have to fear evil. For our God is with us. And he describes him as the Lord of hosts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The Lord of hosts, what does is, what is the Lord of hosts mean? It, it means uh, the Lord of armies. And these are angel armies that he is describing here in verse 7. The Lord of hosts, his angelic host. And then he goes on to say that the God of Jacob is our stronghold. Jacob is the son of Isaac through whom the promise of God to establish a people for his own possession would be fully materialized through his sons. Jacob, his name would be changed to Israel and he would have sons that would become the heads of the tribes of Israel, the 12 tribes. And throughout the entire journey of Jacob and throughout the, the, the life of the people of Israel in terms of their captivity and, and Egypt and that coming out as a nation and the, the 40 years wandering in the, in the deserts and, and all the things, God, God's commitment, God's covenant to his people has never changed. It is steadfast. Even though they have moved at many fronts and many times throughout history uh, far away from God, and not worshiping, and their hearts were far from God. God is the stronghold of Jacob. He is immovable, is what he is saying. And so when we are surrounded by our enemies, as Luther says, all these fanatical spirits, all the gates of hell, the implacable hatred of the devil, and all the assaults of the world like covid 19 and also our flesh and our own sin we are as secure as if we were singing the praises of the lord jesus christ around the celestial throne in glory those who belong to christ those who belong to the lord god this one true god through faith in christ we are in god's hands and i encourage you to turn to the lord i, I encourage you to hear this word and know that Christ, by his sacrifice, he has made that provision that we can become a part of the household of God. We, we, we can become a part of his holy city, the city of God, his holy dwelling place, and that we would dwell with him, as David says, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That is the confidence of a man who knew that he belonged to God. And I would encourage you to turn to God. And you turn to God through His Son, Jesus Christ, who died for our sins. So let us rest in the strength of God. And let us rest in the security of God. And then third, let us rest briefly here in the sovereignty of God. He says to us, Come, behold the works of the Lord. In other words, He is now testifying he has given evidence you don't believe what i'm saying come behold the works of the lord come and look and see what god has done and david he goes on to say in the form of a question who has wrought desolations in the earth and what kind of des desolations are they 
Well, he, he's talking about, you know, most specifically, um, wars. He says, he makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. In other words, that there will, there, there will come a day when there will never be another war forever. He is going to bring all war to an end. He breaks the bow. This is a description of why, um, you know, as, as, as he is going to cease uh, wars to the ends of the earth, uh, therefore bows and spears will no longer be necessary. So he breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. And he burns the chariots with fire and chariots in, in ancient Israel in the days of of David and his people, chariots were like, like tanks and other high weaponry in our day. They, those were the elite weaponry of war in those days. And it says that you know, those, he burns them up. They're gone. They're no longer necessary. He destroys all the implements of war is what he's saying here. Because there, no, there, there will no longer be any war. So David reminds us of God's power to protect us against anything by showing his complete victory of, over all the forces arrayed against us, even throughout world history. It's a final picture that he is painting here. He is giving us a look forward into the future to where we can look at that and say, the day is coming when this war, the war of this life, the assaults of this life, no more sorrow, no more, no more sickness, no more death. For who? To those who belong to the Lord through His Son, Jesus Christ. Rest in the, the realities of these challenges. It, it doesn't mean that we are, God is, God is going to remove us from these circumstances. It doesn't mean that there are loved ones that even recently, this, this past spring, and my father who fought an admirable um, battle with lung cancer. But he loved the Lord. And we rested in the hope that, that even if, if he would no longer continue with us here on this earth, that from, from the time that he breathed his last breath, he went on to be with the Lord, to be absent from the body, is to be with Christ, is to be present with Christ. That is the promise of Scripture to every believer. So my brothers and sisters, as we look at these circumstances, do not be overwhelmed. Don't allow these circumstances uh, to be the last reality in your thinking because we know that there is a greater reality, that, that God is our strength, that God is sovereign in all circumstances, that, that, that God is present. We have this great security because He is with us. God's refuge, His security, His sovereignty. And finally, as we conclude, rest in the knowledge of God. He says here, cease striving. Now, we, we have heard this text translated, and it, it is correct to translate it, that way as well, but to be still. Now, sometimes we don't think of being still as, um, you know, ceasing to strive. Striving seems like, you know, you're like overly giving energy to something. But if you think of it in the, 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 the context of, of a child, a little rambunctious child full of energy and, and just, you know, is just bouncing off the walls and, you know, a parent or a grandparent uh, or who a babysitter who's watching them, and they, they get to a point where they're just bouncing off the walls and doing all kinds of crazy things. And what do we say? Be still. Be still. In other words, we want you to stop. And, and God is saying that in the context is that we're not just full of energy and bouncing off the walls in, in terms of the, you know, the, the state of, of a child that, that may be uh, doing that, but you know, what he is describing here in terms of our striving, is that we are in the midst of difficulty. That we're in the midst, right in the middle of trial and tribulation or suffering or illness. Or as we find in terms of our world and our whole world, 
is now watching this virus as it, it just continues to spread throughout the entire world, uh, our, our, the watching world. It, this has its attention, and rightly so. And as we began, as we talked about the realities of, of, of all the, the leadership, both politically and, and medically and, and the organizations and all these uh, people are, are gathering and rallying together to meet these challenges. I want you to know that these circumstances, even, even for those who, in terms of, of life, have lost their life, they've lost their life to this battle. I want you to know that God is with us. We pray for mercy for the families and for these individuals who are walking through this and for our, our world and, and, and our nation and our communities and as we come alongside one another, even at, at a distance as it is. And this is one of the ways that we are coming alongside one another so that we can try to stem the tide of, of the spread of this. But this is not the last word on the reality. This, this is not, in terms of these circumstances, these are not the final word in terms of reality. No, the final word is concerning God. Cease striving and know that I am God. And he declares here that I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Now, we can look at it from the standpoint of, of nations who have raged and then he has toppled and, and he has brought the end of wars and he has spoken no more. And that is the end of war and the end of raging and roaring nations. And that's one way that we can look at. You see striving in war no more. We can look at it from that standpoint. And I think he is. I think that we, we, could, we could take from these truths that God is speaking to his enemies and our enemies. But I also think that he is speaking to us as his people. That we easily become anxious and get worried, and rightfully so, there's a lot that's going on in our world that is fueling that. But he is, he is instructing us, be still and know that I am God. Because I will be exalted among the nations. And I will be exalted in the earth. And you know, one of the ways that God is exalted among the nations and in the earth is by his people resting in him and encouraging others with the hope that we have in Christ. David is certainly describing a key central truth of the Bible with regards to the exaltation of God among the nations and all the earth. As God promises in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 14, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In other words, you know, the waters cover 100% of the sea. And God says that the earth will 100% be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God. And he goes on to say that the Lord of hosts, the Lord of angel armies, is with us. And we see that, that God is not only speaking of pre present circumstances, but there is a day coming when his son returns. And at that time, the fruition in its fullness will begin to unfold that his he will be exalted among all the nations and in the earth. Why? Because he will be here, physically, on this earth. Listen to what John, the, the disciple and the apostle John, writes about this in the revelation that he received in Revelation 19, verse 11 and following. And I saw heaven opened. Behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it is called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and wages war his eyes are a flame of fire and his on his head are many diadems and he has 
He has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, the armies, the hosts, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. The Lord of hosts is with us. And the God of Jacob is our stronghold. The God of Jacob is our stronghold against all enemies in this world. Brothers and sisters, we can rest wholeheartedly this morning in the strength, the security, the sovereignty, and the knowledge of this one and only true Redeemer God. But to know God truly is to know that the greatest enemy in this world is is the one that stands against him. And what does that look like? For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We, we as those who continue in our sin, are those who stand against God. We might think that God's greatest enemy is Satan and his demons, and, and rightfully so, they are raging against God and his people even devastating viruses and diseases of this world are not the greatest enemy. If you have God as your refuge, if you know Him and are in fellowship with God and believe in God, you know that the means by which you came to know God truly was through His Son, Jesus Christ. I want you to know that our greatest hope is found and believing and turning our lives from our sin and repenting of that sin and turning to Christ who is the one who forgives us of our sin. And when we come under Him, when we come through Christ, we come under the shelter of the forgiveness of our sins. And that is through the costly sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross for our sins. Martin Luther shared this from his own redemption experience. I am covered under the shadow of Christ's wings. And I live without fear under that wide banner of the forgiveness of sins that is spread over me. Therefore, God covers and pardons the remnant of sin in me. That is, because of the faith which, which I began to lay hold upon Christ. He accepts my imperfect righteousness as perfect righteousness and counts my sin as no sin, even though it indeed is sin. But the reason why he does that is because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Do you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Luther wrote, Did we in our own strength confide? Our striving would be losing. We're not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. Thus ask who that may be. Christ Jesus, it is is he, Lord Sabaoth, his name, from age to age the same. And he shall win this battle. Father, I thank you for the gift of our time together here in your word. And may you encourage your church as we have gathered together in different locations throughout the Middle Ohio Valley and, and maybe other parts of this country. Lord, I thank you that you strengthen us by your word and that you are our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. And Lord, we are in trouble. And you are aware of these circumstances. And so, Lord, we pray for your grace and your mercy 
and your intervention. We pray for your wisdom. We pray for your continued hand uh, with our leadership and uh, our medical personnel and everybody that is on the front lines working through this challenge. But Father God, we pray that you would work through them, through us, for your glory. And that maybe these circumstances that we're walking through today would be the means by which you bring other people to come and trust in you. May they come and repent and turn to you from their sin through the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Make it so, Father God. Awaken them to life through your Son, by your Spirit. It's in the name of Jesus Christ I pray. And amen.